So I finally watched The Sopranos, which was a big deal from, I don't know, 2000 to 2007 or so. And I mentioned before in a different of these videos that I am troubled by the fact that increasingly the protagonists of shows are sociopaths. And I am troubled by um, how much we are asked to identify with sociopaths in films and TV. And I, I do believe that that correlates to an increase of socio sociopathy in this culture. Um, I found myself as I was watching The Sopranos very, very disturbed by a lot of the behaviors of a lot of the people. And I, I, I suddenly liked the show um, a lot more when I reframed it. And I, I looked at it not as the story of a bunch of gangsters, but instead as a fictional encyclopedia of sociopathy that if I look at this show as being case studies of sociopaths, then, and what happens when a sociopath enters your life, then the show became really interesting to me. In The Sopranos, let's pretend for a moment that they weren't actually making a, I don't know what they were making, but let's pretend for a moment they weren't making a gangster story. Instead, maybe their germ was, how do we have, I want to show what sociopaths do to relationships. And I want to just do this in a comprehensive manner with all these different forms of sociopaths, all these different narcissists, show them in all sorts of circumstances and show how they destroy everything they touch. It's like, okay, that's nice and interesting, but you basically have this therapist. One of the central things is the, this Tony Soprano going to a therapist. And it's like, that's not very interesting. What if the guy is just a dentist? You know, what if the guy is, works for a moving company? That's going to be really boring. It's just the story of how he's a day-to-day -day abuser who is going to his therapist, and then his night job or his day job is that he works as, you know, I don't know, he works selling tickets at baseball games. That's just, or he works at Walmart. I mean, that's just, so then somebody else I can just see. And once again, I'm making all this up. Somebody else has this idea. Oh, let's take them gangsters. So there's lots of shooting, lots of action. But the real thing we're trying to convey is what all these sociopaths do. And if that's the case, then I think that there are some parts that are really brilliant. And Tony, for example, is, well, well okay, I'm going to back up and say something else I don't like, which is the sex was all entirely pornographied. And I just don't think it happens all that often in real life that somebody goes to test drive a car and the female salesperson says, a salesperson has to accompany you on the test drive and they end up having sex in the car. That happens in pornography. I don't think that happens in real life. And that happened all the time in the movie and I found it, this, this is one of the ways porn culture destroys everything. And I was having, having a, a real problem with this, but there was one good scene that kind of, kind of uh, saved a little bit of it for me, which is where Tony Soprano has always had a crush on his therapist. And at one scene, he's being really aggressive, hypersexually aggressive, as he often is. And uh, she turns him down politely, turns him down politely, turns him down politely, and then he just keeps pushing. And the whole scene was making me incredibly uncomfortable. He keeps saying, why don't you want to go out with me? And she says, well, because you're a former client and that's just bad. And he says, no, 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 really. Why don't you want to go out with me? Keeps pushing, won't take no for an answer. And finally she says, honestly, because our values are different. I, I can accept you as a therapist, but I don't like the fact that you lie. I don't like the fact that you kill people. And as a therapist, it's my job to sit with that. But as an individual human being, I don't want you in my life. And 
this was a beautiful scene because as soon as she says that, and we may have to cut this for YouTube, um, as soon as she says that, he says, and he gets really, really mad. And it was a beautiful scene because it shows right before that he'd been saying, here, I want to take you to Bermuda. I want to do all these wonderful things for you. But it was beautiful in that it showed that underneath all of that is force, ultimately. And this is what happens with abusers. Yes, if you go along with everything I say, look what I can give you. I can give you all these nice things. As soon as it doesn't happen, that hatred. It's, it's, uh, it's the line from Culture Make-Believe and the line from, from Nietzsche about one does not hate when one can despise. So long as he can merely have contempt for her and take advantage of her, then, then that's one thing. But when that doesn't work, he will, the hatred comes out. So if I look at it as an exploration of, of sociopaths, then I, I find it really interesting. And, and this leads to another question, which is the, the first things I ever wrote ever, ever, when I was 21, 22, first things I ever wrote for publication were some uh, book reviews. And the person who taught me to do book reviews said there are three questions you ask. And I think these are three brilliant questions to ask of anything, really. First off, what is a writer trying to do? Second, how well are they doing it? And third, should it be done? So, you know, we can, if we ask, what were the, the authors of The Sopranos trying to do? Well, they were trying to make a lot of money making a hit TV series. Well, how well did they do it? Well, they did that pretty darn well because they made a lot of money. Third, is that worth doing? Well, I would go back to Artie Lang's Few Books Today Are Forgivable and When the World's Being Killed, I don't think that making a lot of money on a TV program really is sufficient. Um, we can ask though, were they trying to make a, an encyclopedia of sociopathy? Let's pretend they were. How well did they do it? They did a great job of that. Three, is it worth doing? And that's why I wanted to do this whole thing. Is that worth doing? And it gets really complicated again because if I were having a conversation with the creators of The Sopranos, they could... You know, I, I don't want to glorify sociopaths, which is what's happening in so much. Well, it's happening in all politics. It's happening in, in so much popular literature. And they could say, what more do you want us to do? We have this therapist who is saying consistently, what you're doing is wrong. The, the therapist is acting, as, as one reviewer put it, as a Greek chorus and saying this, a, a voice of sanity to, to counterbalance the insanity of the entire Soprano world. And it's like, what more do you want us to do? We show that these people are, are doing terrible things. We have the therapist saying they're doing terrible things. We show those moments. And yes, that's true. But when we live in a world where Oliver Stone, and I mentioned this before, where Oliver Stone back in the 90s could do Wall Street, the movie, and he could have a villain, Gordon Gecko, say greed is good. And when you understand that it's a villain saying this, you're supposed to understand that this is a bad thing, but that is taken up as a rallying cry for society and for the economy. Then I think we need to be really careful about portraying sociopaths because, because I don't, because I think a lot of people will end up idolizing. And, I, and a great example which I believe we may have talked about before, is that in Breaking Bad, they, they set out to create an evil character and they were explicit that he's supposed to be very evil, but a lot of people thought he was good. And so what do you... What do you do with that? And then there's another level too, which is did the, did the creators of... What, did, what were the creators of The Sopranos trying to do? And that's... That's an interesting question, but it also may, may not be important. See, here's part of the problem too. I wrote about this in my book, The Culture of Make-Believe, that even when they, I mean, there's, de there's very definitely a pornographic perspective 
relentlessly pushed in the Sopranos, absolutely relentlessly pushed. And, and uh, Gail Dines talks about this and how the Sopranos is a great example. It's a beautiful example of patriarchy in that the males are all, one of the things that Gail Dines has talked about is how patriarchy socializes males to essentially say and enact fuck you. And it socializes women to say and enact fuck me. And that's how all the women, their jobs in this show are to take care of men, sexually or otherwise. And the men's jobs are to be obnoxious sociopaths who destroy anything that gets in their way. I want to bring in one more thing, which is that, um, you know, the Tony Soprano character beats up people a lot. And one of the reasons I decided to do this, this video is because he beats up people all the time. And at first I was thinking he just has low impulse control and he's very angry. And it's like, that's not very interesting. And it's, it's pretty, anyway, it's, it, it's dramatic, but I, I didn't like it. And then there's a scene where he ends up in the hospital. He's very, he, he got shot and he's in the hospital. He's very ill. He gets out of the hospital and he's changed and he's, he's a bit nicer. And also he's still recovering from his, his, uh, his surgery and his, his near death experience. And so he is nicer to people. And then one day he says to his therapist, I feel like because I'm being nicer, people are going to lose respect for me. And in the next scene, he picks a fight with a perfectly innocent uh, bodyguard and beats the crap out of him for no reason. Um, he says, why did you slam the refrigerator door? The guy says, I didn't slam the refrigerator door. And he says, oh, so now you're telling me I'm lying to you. And then he jumps up and starts hitting him. And this is classic abuser tactics. And the reason I bring this up is because Lundy Bancroft in his book, Inside the Minds of Anger and Controlling Men, or why do they do that inside the minds of anger and controlling men talked about how abusers don't actually lose control. It's not impulse control is the problem. Instead, their violence is tactical. And the directors, writers of this show did a beautiful job there of showing that Tony is not in fact losing control, but his acts of even seemingly random violence are instead messages to people, messages to the person who got beaten up and messages just to everybody else watching. And so that let me know that they understand abusive dynamics on some level. And, and I get into this problem because I think it's beautiful that they showed it, but there is this problem in modern literature that we aren't really allowed to speechify. And I guess what I wanted is for that to be brought home to people so people will understand, well, they, they won't just be wallowing in the violence, but instead the people will get that this is what's happening. So to, to turn it into a more effective teaching tool and to, and I know that there are going to be, if any screenwriters are watching this or any directors are watching this, they're rolling their eyes going, God, Derek, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. But my response to that is a hundred years ago, people could still write novels. I mean, Grapes of Wrath, it's very clear what the point is. And Johnny Got His Gun, very clear what the point is. Um, Heart of Darkness, very clear what the point is. Anything by Thomas Hardy, very clear what the point is. And we've sort of moved away from that where we will show something, show something very effectively, but the message gets all mixed. And I want to add one more thing, and I don't know where this fits into the whole picture, but I think it's really important, which is that in my early 20s, I saw a film that was, I thought, the most dramatic and powerful exploration of what childhood sexual abuse does to a person's psyche. The movie was called Repulsion. And the movie was written and directed by, get this, Roman Polanski, who himself sexually abused at least one young woman and presumably many more. And 
so the the movie is basically about this woman who has some severe it's played by Catherine Deneuve and she she has some severe problems uh certain triggers will cause her to like when the when bells ring at the monastery next door she will suddenly flash back to being sexually assaulted by somebody um she, she at some point she's walking down a hallway and all of a sudden the uh all sorts of hands start reaching out and groping her breasts and um there are a couple of men who try to get close to her one of them tries to sexually assault her the other one just basically tries to ask her on a date and she ends up killing both of them and to make it very very clear the whole thing is just getting stranger and stranger and then the last shot is um she's basically catatonic and um the 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 camera pans over some stuff on the floor including a postcard that shows the leaning tower of pisa that has been folded and unfolded so the P leaning tower of pisa is kind of cracked doesn't take freud to figure that one out and then it moves up to a childhood photograph that shows a family and closes in on this one young girl who is blonde like Catherine Deneuve and she's looking out of the corner of her eye with unutterable hate at what looks to be her uncle who is sitting right here and all of a sudden everything in the movie comes together that all of these flashbacks all of this nightmare that she's been living is because of this guy and this blew me away so much that and also, I knew Roman Polanski. I knew his, I knew I knew about him. This is in the early '80s that I read this, or that I watched this. So I went to look. I checked out the screenplay from the local university library, and Roman Polanski had no idea what he was doing. He wasn't doing this on purpose. In fact, the scenes where she's having flashbacks of being sexually assaulted, he calls those fantasies, and. Um, at the very end, where it's focusing in on her eye, which is staring at this guy with hate. Instead, it says we, we end by focusing in on her eye, which shows that even as a child, she was, she was severely mentally disturbed. And my point is, as I wrote about in Culture Make-Believe, when perpetrators try to conceal their stories, they still end up revealing truth because the truth will out. And so Roman Polanski tried to do this story about this horrible woman, but instead he made this story about, unintentionally made this story about what happens when you sexually abuse a child. And so I don't know what the editors and I mean, what the directors and, and writers of The Sopranos were trying to do with their film and I don't really want to sit here and pontificate on you know, past judgment on what they did. It's just I found it really interesting because on one hand, I mean, this is a problem that those of us who, who do write some fiction face is how do you, I face this with my own work too, that even with the nonfiction that I try to be as clear as I can that I am describing the horrors as clearly as I can to attempt to get people to feel how awful this is to make a change. But there have been a few times where people have accused me falsely, I believe, of wallowing in and getting off on the atrocities that I describe. And so it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. That let's pretend that the Sopranos, that everybody associated with it, wanted to do an encyclopedia of sociopaths. Like, how, especially when you live in a culture of sociopaths, how are you going to do that without reinforcing the sociopathy? You know, I've been very careful 
when I wrote Songs of the Dead, which is about a serial killer, um, one of the things that I was very, and, and there is, there, there are some scenes of, of the serial killer doing terrible things to people, but given that we live in this pornographic culture, I was very careful to write those scenes such that I didn't want any sick individuals jerking off to them. And so I was very careful when I wrote them to try to make it so they wouldn't be, they couldn't be misused. I don't know. See, I, I, this, this, some, of, some of the videos I can end on some stirring note because often it's something I've thought about for a long time and I've come to a conclusion. This one, I'm really asking questions and I'm asking how does one in a culture of sociopaths describe sociopaths in a way that serves the destruction of sociopathy and not its promotion. And again, if the, if the directors of Sopranos were, were sitting here talking to me, they would be saying, perhaps, what do you want from us? Because there was a, a beautiful scene in one of the shows where two of the, two of the male characters are interacting and they're getting along fine. And then Tony Soprano, sort of the chief, the chief sociopath, shows up. And within about a minute, the other two are at each other's throats, which is my experience of dealing with sociopaths, by the way, that a sociopath can create problems for anybody around them. And so that was brilliantly done. But then again, we have all of this just overtly pornographic sex in it. It's like sexual, porn influenced sex, I should say. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a very difficult. I wish I had some stirring conclusion, but I guess, I guess what we can say is that, you know, R.D. Lang, the first line of the politics of experience was few books today are forgivable. And he was, that line has influenced me profoundly. And what I believe he was trying to say with that was that we live in such an alienated state that few books, that if a book doesn't take that alienation as its starting point and attempt to rectify it, then it's not forgivable. And that is certainly true of TV, film. Here's the thing. Art is a weapon. And it can be used for many purposes. As we've said before, this is a problem I have with a lot of pop music, is that, that they'll have some power chord that will open up people inside. And in a traditional indigenous community, those sorts of, that sort of musical opening would be used to then transfer a message of communal well-being, but instead that those chords can open people up and then deliver slow riding woman feels so fine or deliver some other message written by an 18 year old rock star who has nothing good to say. So if I guess that's what, I guess that is the ending, is that um,
I believe that recognizing that, you know, there was a story by, I believe it was Frederick Brown about uh, a, a very short story about a nuclear physicist who worked on nuclear weapons and he had a son who was developmentally disabled, an adult who had the mind of a child essentially. And he had a friend who was an anti-nuclear activist and they come and they talk this, this evening. And then the, the nu- anti-nuclear activist goes and says good night to the, to the, to the developmentally disabled son and then leaves. And then the, the father goes in to say good night to his son. And he sees that the anti-nuclear activist has given his son a loaded gun. And the last line of the story was, what sort of madman would give a child a loaded gun? And the point made in the story was that the physicist was doing this by making nuclear weapons. And I think the same thing is true with art that I think an artist must be aware at every moment that they are pointing or handing out loaded guns. And that comes with tremendous responsibility. And I am not entirely certain that all artists understand this. One of the things that's really difficult is that even if it is an encyclopedia of, of sociopaths, I'm, I'm only ruining this for the seven people who don't yet know that Tony Soprano dies at the end, presumably, but it's, it's, it's not 100% clear that he dies, but he probably dies at the end of the show. And my point here is that even though he's a sociopath, even though he's just horrible in every way, when the, the danger is that even knowing all that, as the last scene unfolded where he is presumably going to die at the end, I teared up. I cared about him. I didn't want him to die. And earlier times when he'd been in trouble, I didn't want him to die. Why? Simply because he's the protagonist. That's the power of a protagonist. And that's the danger. That's one of the dangers of having a sociopath as your protagonist. Yes, they did this powerful thing with all this encyclopedia of sociopaths, but I still cared about him. I didn't want him, I didn't want bad things to happen to him. And what do we do with that? You know, they actually make this point in the show that uh, his therapist is very aware he's a sociopath and his therapist, until the very end, she, uh, she likes him. She, she, she has a similar response that I do. She's appalled at the same time. It's like engaging character. Plus she's, you know, doing the therapeutic role. And the only thing that gets her out of it is somebody else just hammers into her uh, in a couple, three different incidents uh, that the psychological literature shows that the talking cure therapy does not actually help sociopaths, but instead enables them to further rationalize their sociopathic behavior. So she gets it, and then she, uh, she dumps him as a client at the very end. And that, so if, if, here's the thing, if we switch it all around and we perceive, if, if a protagonist in a novel is, has to undergo a significant change in behavior and personality or significant change in realization uh, in order for the novel to be fully realized, then she, in fact, is the protagonist. If we switch our framing so that she's the protagonist, and she is the one who goes through the learning curve, because Tony never changes, because sociopaths don't change. He becomes more sophisticated, but he's still the same sociopath. If we switch the whole thing around, so it's not actually the Sopranos as the main characters, but instead Dr. Malfi is the main character, then 
we have someone who made a realization and who was able to free herself from the sociopathy. So literally, literally, by making him the protagonist, I have ended up identifying with the oppressor. Literally, that's what happened. That's the danger. That's why I'm so troubled with this.